You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring the scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Hello and welcome to Proof Text. I am Michael Halcom, and in this episode, we're going to hear from a fellow Christ follower, my good friend, Dr. Carl Sweatman. Uh, before we get going on that, uh, Carl, how are you? Doing well, man. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah it's good to see you. It's been, a, it's been a while. We've talked on the phone a few times, uh, yeah. but it's been a while since I've seen you. Um, I'm yeah. Probably- <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, amen to that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, in these testimony uh, sort of episodes, I think I'm calling them um, lost to found or something along those lines. Um, yeah, I, I'm interested in talking with fellow Christ followers about, you know, what it was, what life was like before Christ, if they can remember. You know, some people don't ever remember a time uh, before Christ um, in their lives. And then that moment was like to meet Christ or when Christ met them. And then afterwards, what's it been like since? So that's sort of the trajectory of these episodes. And um, these are so encouraging to me. And um, I'm eager to hear uh, you share more of your story, Carl. So let's let's start. Um, what was like life what was life like before christ not like bc you know before christ era um but yeah in your life what was can you remember a distinct time like before that or not really uh sort of uh so i grew up in the church um i mean the the running joke is i grew up southern baptist before i became a christian um uh, so <laughs> that's a good one yeah, so I, so yeah, I was I was truly raised in a Southern Baptist Church you know, in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Second Apostolic on Baptist, and I mean we went uh, honestly since I could remember. So we were talking four or five years old. I remember being there, and it was at that time it was just uh, myself, my older brother, and my mom, um, and so we we went, and that was that. And then when my mom got remarried when I was eight ish, somewhere around there, eight or nine. Um, we changed churches and we went to uh, what was Mount Carmel Christian Church then. Mm. And so we were part of the youth group, or I was part of the children's ministry, brother, uh, part of the youth group. And then when he was around 12-ish, no, 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 14, um, he he decided he wanted to give his life to Christ. And because at the time he was my older brother and I looked up to him and, you know, I just wanted to follow in his footsteps, I said, so do I. Um, but I mm. didn't really fully understand, uh, even though when I had a chat with the children's minister, because that's what they did. They just wanted to see where the kids were at. Yeah. Uh, and when he would ask the questions, I knew the answers. But that was really the extent of it was I knew the answers. Um, and so when I was like nine or so, we we went forward, uh, did the whole confession for the church, did the baptism thing. Um and then that was that. And I just, we stayed in the church. Um, you know, I was part of the youth group. I was active whole, whole nine yards. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, my, my move into Christian belief, it was pretty, pretty fluid. Um, right. it was almost natural right. cause it was, it was already there. Um, but then when it went a little bit awkward <laughs> was late high school. Um, I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do. Um, and then my senior year, I had a definite idea, and that was I originally wanted to go into uh, be an Army Ranger, and huh. so I had already I had already applied to a school in North Georgia. It was North Georgia Military Academy at that time, or North Georgia College. Um, so I was already accepted. I was already ready to roll, and I was set to go visit my brother, who I hadn't seen in probably five six years because he he went to Cincinnati, which is no more. Um, he went there and then he got a youth ministry position just outside of uh, Louisville. And so he invited me to come up and be, you know, just be there for the summer with him. And so during that time of leading up to me going to visit him, 
um, it was kind of a crisis within me of what do I really want to do with my life? Mm. And then just out of the blue, I was with my parents and I said, you know what? I have a strange feeling that once I go and do this thing with Derek, my brother, um, that ministry is pretty much what I want to do. And my mom runs off and she goes to call my brother and she says, have you talked to Carl you know, like within the past couple of weeks? And he's like, no, I hadn't talked to him in about a month. Yeah. And she said, because he just said this. And it was the exact same thing that he had said about two months ago to, to her. Huh. Uh, and so I went up and sure enough, I just, I had a, I had a poll for ministry. Um, and so I canceled the thing with North Georgia. They were not too happy about that. Uh, then I went to Atlanta Christian College and I was there for two years. Uh, I had to make up a degree because they didn't have a children's ministry degree program. So I just made one up. I was double majoring in youth ministry and early childhood education. Interesting. Sounds just like a children's made one up. Yeah. So, so where, where in that, or have you not gotten to yet? Where, where was <laughs> like the, can you pinpoint like a, a moment or a location when like Christ, the spirit of Christ just like hit you and you're like, that's it. I, I, I know that was the spirit of Christ and, uh, or is it not, is it, is that too difficult to sort of pinpoint that? No, that one's not, uh, because that one was a definite time period. Um, it took about two months, two or three months to, for it to totally unfold. So what had happened was I, I had gone to Atlanta Christian with uh, two of my best friends. One of them was my roommate. And then two months into that, one of my friends, Jack, he decided he wanted to go back home to Tennessee, so he left. Uh, the girl that I was dating at the time, she broke up with me because she admitted she was cheating on me with somebody else. Um, and then December rolls around, and my roommate and I, we get into a nasty argument, um, like verbal argument. And he leaves, and he moves off campus to go live with another roommate. And so he and I wind up not speaking for a few months. Then he gets thrown into the hospital because he had already had an existing heart condition. Um, he had heart trans he had, excuse me, heart surgery at five years old, transplant at 14, and then at 21, he was back in the hospital about to die because his heart was going. Wow. So I learn about this while I'm away on a vacation, or not a vacation, but at a, like a youth retreat. I'm helping out as a chaperone. I have find out about it, so I drive home. And I go to the hospital and I go with the intent to say, I'm sorry, because I was a schmuck and, you know, I shouldn't have treated him that way. When I get there, <clears throat> the the time available to have chats and all that was really small. Then the nurse comes in and says, time to go home. So I was like, I'll see you later. Uh, we'll talk more. And he's like, see you later. We shook hands. Um, and then I get a call later that night that he had passed away. So all of those things of my friend moving away, girlfriend breaking up with me, and then John dying suddenly when I can't apologize, it it put me in pretty much a, a hellish place. Um, and so for months, that's where I was. Um, and I realized that something was going on within me. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I started to have some pretty wicked dreams. Uh, my dreams are usually really vivid anyway, and I try not to remember them for that reason. Um, yeah. but for about a month, I started having some pretty wicked dreams and they were very dark, uh, very sinister. Um, so it was like dark night of the soul on steroids wow. and it was a lot of weird stuff that I'll, you know, I'll bypass all of that for now. Um, but that coincided with a crisis that I was already going through with my own faith. And that was, I was coming to the realization that my faith was essentially a borrowed faith. I had borrowed it from my older brother. It was never really my own. And so going through not only those dreams, but also just the spiritual experience of, of loss um, and grief, not just of friends, but even within myself. Um, I remember the day, it was March 27th, that I hit the ground in tears and could not get up for about a day. And it was wow. me just praying and crying out, God, I'm not worthy to be saved, but please do so because I can't do this. Um, and then the following day, um, I went before, it was a chapel service at school, and I went before and I rededicated. Um, and in fact, I 
I did what I counsel other people not to do, uh, which is I, I went to be baptized again because I knew that my first mm -hmm. baptism, it was I did it because my brother did it and I didn't fully understand it. Um, so this time it was if I'm going to surrender fully, then I'm going to do it because I know. Um, and so that was that was the big day. Wow, that's that's pretty dramatic. Um, especially that bit with the the friend and not not getting to apologize. <laughs> the idea of a borrowed faith. I think probably a lot of people, a lot of people can um, relate to that to to some degree. Um, in some way, though, like all of our, you know, in some way, our faith is a borrowed faith like it's a handed on faith it's a handed down faith mm -hmm. um, yet there is a sense right in which it needs to take root the gospel needs to take root within e each one of us and and you know start to to grow so you have this period where you grow up in the church you're in youth group you you know go through all the rigmarole and you even go off to bible college you're even at camp, you're even at camp, like helping, helping chaperone and stuff like that. Um, yet it isn't until this moment in, I guess, Bible college where your friend is, has just passed that you're kind of like punched in the face, uh, by the spirit of Christ. And, um, so this is a clear, like tipping point. Oh yeah. You. And oh, yeah. what what has life been like since? And that was years ago. <laughs> yeah, that uh, was years ago. Uh so that was 97. Um so I mean life has been it's it's been a challenge in a lot of ways uh because there's been a lot of um uncertainties, a lot of moments of Let me put it this this way. So when I was working, so I, I went to, I moved to Cincinnati Bible College and did a children's ministry degree there, finished, was doing ministry uh, for about, almost two or three years. And then I resigned from that because of a really, really bad experience with the phrase today is a toxic situation because it really was. Um, and as a young guy and, you know, first real full-time job in the ministry, that it stung really bad. Mm. Uh, so I resigned and went back home and I spent the next year trying to figure out what I needed to do. And in the midst of that, I was still applying for children's ministry jobs because that's kind of what I was still feeling like. Um, but I remember having a conversation with a guy who's a pastor named Kenny White. Um, and I went with the point of having a conversation about interviewing for the children's ministry job. And we're just having a con casual conversation. And he stopped me and he said, you know what? This whole time is I've, I've been getting the sense that really children's ministry is not where you need to be. And he said, I think really what you need to be doing is doing something more, uh, either more education or do, you know, higher up in the church, like go senior ministry type thing. And I said, it's funny you say that because I've been thinking about that, but I've never been sure about it. And primarily, I don't know if I have yeah. the ability to do those things. And he said that it's usually in those moments when you think you can't do it. That's when you need to lean into God the most because he is the one who can do it. But you've got to step out in faith with him and allow him to show you the way. Um, and that's that was a huge moment uh, for, for me in terms of more owning my faith. Um, it, it can't just be something that I have in my head. It can't just be something that I just simply know in my heart. It's got to be something that I own and that owns me. Um, mm. And so that was a big push. And so from there, I decided, okay, I need to go back in education. Um, so I did the master's thing, did the PhD thing. And um, in the midst of that, got, got married to my wonderful wife. Uh, she's known me since I was 11. She was nine. Wow. <laughs> Uh, which means I can't get away with crap. So he, <laughs> she knows all of it, man. Um, but it's it's wonderful. Um, so we we got back together and got married, and we've got two wonderful kids now. Uh, but we we moved overseas, did the PhD thing, started looking for teaching jobs, 
and uh, that wasn't working. And then my wonderful wife, <laughs> she said, maybe God's trying to say something. Maybe church is where you need to be. And when she said that, and we both prayed about it, there was immediately a sense of peace in the house because prior to that, there was a lot of tension because we weren't sure what was going to happen, where we were going to have to move, what kind of job, all that. So it was just tense. But as soon as we both admitted, maybe that's what God is doing is pushing me back into ministry. It was just peace. And honestly, I haven't looked back at that decision. Um, yeah. I mean, I know that you and I have had a couple of conversations yeah. where I'm like, you know, would you consider teaching something I'm like, yeah, not in a full time basis, but maybe a seminar or something. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, the draw for academic settings is not is not there anymore. Um, so a lot of that's just been a, a testing ground for me because a lot of those experiences between resigning from the children's ministry and then where I'm at now, a lot of that was a huge proving ground um, where where I've had to lean so much into God and trust and, and know that, okay, I may not like what I'm going through, but he, he's got something in mind. So. Hmm. And so it's interesting. Um, your, your whole life has like one of the common themes there is your whole life has sort of, you've been connected to the church. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've had experiences, you've, you've moved from one denomination to another, uh, you've had experiences where things were toxic, <laughs> um, yeah, you've, I'm, I'm assuming you've had good experiences, I mean, you, you're, you're saying it's good now, right. um, so, but just the the centrality, I don't know if that's the right word, but yeah, you know, the centrality of the church in your life stands out to me. Because as somebody who didn't grow up in the church, uh, you know, that just wasn't, it was non-existent in my life for the first 14, 15, 16 years. It wasn't even a thing, you know. Um, yeah, so that really stands out to me. Um, yeah, what I'm I'm curious to to hear just your views on like a sort of brief nutshell theology of the church maybe like why 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 is the church so vital um I don't know I don't know where I'm going with that but that's just sort of what I'm that stands out to me so off the cuff, uh, I would say that it would be, for me, the church has, yes, it has defined so much of my, my life. Um, I mean, I, I was truly raised in the era where my parents told me that if, if it conflicts with church, we don't do it. Um, so there were, you know, there were several things that, you know, a lot of people would look on and go, you missed out on so many great opportunities. You know, yeah, I mean, I enjoyed playing baseball. Yeah, I enjoyed doing cross country and track. Yeah, I like doing karate, but I, I don't, I don't feel bad because I didn't become a pro in any of those things. You know, I, I, mm. I enjoyed the time doing it, but uh, church was more important. So yeah, church was definitional um, in terms of my life, but I think that is part of the point um, because it's the the church is the place where we come together as redefined in Christ. And it's from that community of redefined people that we understand who we are and what we're called to do. Um, and then when we come together with that heart and that mind and that focus, um, then it creates that atmosphere of full submission and full worship of, of the one who made all of it possible. Because if we try to do this thing on our own, we'd screw it up. Yeah. Like do everything else, but you know, um, what what would you say to somebody who who's like yeah I tried church uh terrible experience not for me <laughs> I would have to borrow from Alan Parr I think uh not too long ago I heard him say something along these lines um he said would you know would would you treat other experiences in life like that 
where you had a bad day at work, are you going to call off all of work? You're never going to work again because you had a bad experience. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. in ch church, church life is the same way. I mean, it's, it's full of people. Those people are broken. They're going to screw up. In fact, I mentioned that this past Sunday in my sermon was that the, one of the great encouragements is that the disciples with Jesus, they say some of the stupidest things. Mm. And sometimes they do some of the stupidest things. But Christ never looks at them and goes, you know what, guys? You're done. Out of here. Mm. They, they, he, he allows them to stay, and he brings that compassionate correction with, with what he's doing and what he's teaching them of, yeah, you're an idiot right now, but let's do better. So, mm. yeah, you're going to have a bad experience every now and then. Um, but what's more important, being defined by Christ or being defined by a bad experience that is really just a momentary thing? Hmm. One's eternal, one's not. So, um, yeah. So it's interesting. Um, I didn't grow up in the church, as I said, but in my household, we do the same thing your parents did. If it conflicts with church, church wins. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's so incredibly valuable. Do you have that same rule for your kids? Is that, yeah? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Dude, I love that. Um, and I think, I think that sends like such an incredibly strong message to our kids. Because um, I mean, really, if, they, if they don't see what's a priority in our lives, then they've got no reason to make it a priority in theirs. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, the, the phrase I've heard from so many parents, you know, when sports seasons are going is, they only get to be kids once, you know, and, you know, you get this kind of lapid or vapid excuse, whatever the word is, um, empty excuse. They only get to be kids once. And that's said in the spirit of, so let them play, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, my response, yeah, they only get to be kids once. You only get to raise them once. And if you don't do it right this time and show them what's priority right now, your one chance is gone. Um, yeah. Well, I, that's, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you guys do that. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not crazy. Maybe we are crazy, but we still do that. Um, anyway, and that, that's encouraging. Well, man, I, I, I appreciate you sharing some of your story and, uh, it's cool to see how the church has, um, nurtured you and, and how you're able, it's still nurturing you, even though you're a senior pastor, yep. um, yep. but you're able to, you've been able over sort of your life span to give to the church in different ways. And, uh, it's a really cool thing to be able to talk about. Um, yeah. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that, man. Um, appreciate that. Um, hey, if you're listening to the podcast and you're a Christ follower and you're like, man, I should go share my story with Michael, get in touch with me. Go to goalshouse.com, get in touch with me and uh, message me on YouTube or whatever. Um, but, yeah, check out goalshouse.com, the Glosshouse YouTube page. And, uh, yeah, Carl, you're on social. People can find you on there. Yep. Uh, yeah. You're on, what, Facebook? or I know you're on Facebook. Uh -huh. Yeah, just Facebook and Instagram. All right. Yeah. But, All right. And what church do you pastor? So it's Church Christ at Manor Woods. Um, but <laughs> we, we get a little bit of a mix up with the name. It's not a non instrumental Church of Christ. It's just Church of Christ. Um, in what state? So it's in Rockville, Maryland. So we're Rockville. about 20, 25 minutes north of DC. So people who are listening, can they go to can you Google your church and find you preaching? Yep. It's on manorwoods.com. Uh, on the YouTube channel, I th I don't remember that address, but it's linked on our in the website. So, yeah. Gotcha. All right. Excellent. Yep. In fact, we're going through the Kyle Adaman series of Not a Fan right now. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um. Business. Yeah. Well, uh, dude, it's good to see you, and uh, you. glad you're doing well. Keep up the good work, and thanks everybody for listening. Um. Yeah. Share your story with us. Uh, I'm gonna stop there and say I hope that helps. 
Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glossa House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.